Hello and welcome to episode four of um, Sam Brian Astor's Friends. Today I am with a long-time friend, um, musician, composer, he wears a lot of hats, political commentator, columnist, all sorts of things, um, Hugh Morris. Hugh, how are you doing, mate? All right? Yeah, not bad. Thanks, Sam. How are you? How are you pretty, doing? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Thanks. Now, we, yeah. you and I went to school together, so that means... We've known each other 10 years. God, 10 years. It's, it's proper weird. Like, I was, I was doing some, some work for Fram uh, during lockdown, and I was, it was for, like, year seven classes. And I was just, like, some of these people will be half my age. Like, who will be watching these videos. It's just like, oh, man, 10 years, man. It's 10 yeah, years. yeah, that's... Um... <laughs> Yeah, it's it's absolutely ridiculous to think about. But as you say, half your age, the people that are starting from were yeah. born. It's the year we yeah. started from. Yeah, it's like it's all the people who don't have like who have who don't have like ninety eight or ninety seven or whatever in their like in their user names for stuff. Oh, yeah. It's all like it's like oh four, oh five. I'm like, what? I know. You shouldn't be able to exist. No. <laughs> um, okay, so Hugh, as I say, you are a musician, um, a really uh, talented musician. And what I wanted to know is, have you just always been into music? Because I know you and your brother are. So was this, um, was it like, are your parents musical? Have you just always been around that sort of environment? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say I've, I've, always been, I've always been interested in uh in music my parents are both really uh yeah like really musical but not like not sort of professionals but yeah they always sort of there was always music going on and uh always a really weird mix of of stuff i remember i've been trying to think like during lockdown uh what interested like where my sort of interest in, in music actually came from and i think one of the big moments was when uh my dad got a new car when i was about Oh, I must have been about nine or ten, and uh, it was it's an alright car, but it had like a six-shot CD player thing, so you could just like stick six CDs and and just have it was just the most eclectic mix of like Scottish folk and like Bob Marley and just any random stuff that you could get from like Oxfam for like a couple of quid. Um, so yeah, that was always there. Um, yeah, and then uh, my brother and I always did. We grew up in brass bands and stuff, uh, so we always did those together, um, like right through until yeah, until I came back, came down to Manchester really. So uh, yeah, it's it's always been like there or thereabouts, but it took yeah, it took a little while for to actually realise that this was what I wanted to do. Um, uh, yeah, I remember that moment quite vividly. I remember like I was doing some, I was playing the piano in my house, and uh, I just I decided in that moment that uh that I was gonna do music and uh and I went through to the kitchen and told my mum and dad about it and they were just like right okay get back and do like three hours practice like straight off and I was just like what no I could do music without doing that what do you mean uh so yeah uh but yeah I've I don't know I've always been musical um but yeah it took it took a little while to really sort of realize what I've and I'm, yeah, sort of still realizing what I really want to do with it. Uh, at what age? Like twenty-two now. God. <laughs> so, what age did you sort of have that epiphany of going? This is what I want I was, to do now. I think I was maybe I was maybe nine or ten. I remember watching. Um, there was a lad called Peter Moore who plays the trombone. He. Uh, he played he played trombone on BBC Young Musician of the Year and like he won it when he was like twelve or thirteen or something. I remember being like I was a couple of years younger than him. Uh did my connection just go? No, no, bro, right, bro, okay. Uh okay. Yeah, um he he won uh BBC Young Musician when he was like twelve, maybe. And I was like a couple of years ago, maybe eight or nine at the time, and I just started playing the trombone. I was like, oh my God, I could actually do that. Like, it doesn't look too different to me. Um, 
and, and that was sort of like an inspiration but yeah maybe maybe I was like 10 or 11 when I decided that I wanted to do something with music but uh I never really decided what uh until maybe like the past sort of I don't know the past six months maybe oh yeah. wow yeah you briefly touched on it there um you but you and your brother Owen being in brass bands and things and obviously I ended up being in a brass band with you at Fram and people at Fram often yeah. talk about <laughs> yeah, yeah people often talk about the Fram brass band glory days being a little bit before us but I think I genuinely think that when we were there it had a bit of a renaissance you know it because I think after I'm not going to ever say that being in the brass band was cool but being in the brass band when we were in it wasn't yeah, for the sure. worst thing uh, to I be was... in. Yeah, <laughs> it was no, it was great. Like to get a um, to get a full brass band out of a like a, a, a kind of comprehensive school uh, at, at that time was was pretty incredible. And like uh, I remember those really weird like oh I can't remember what like band was on, but. Uh, like marching around a block yard like uh when we were practicing doing like the marches for for Beamish. and that was like it was so ridiculously chaotic but it was so much fun <laughs> just like, yeah it just always yeah. is fun because obviously a lot of people like yourself and your brother and other people that were in that band had played and i'm going to come on to it like the miners gala and a more formal brass band in durham but there was a lot of people that played for fun and myself included in that. And then seeing, cause I definitely held you, Catherine Bradshaw, Callum Mellis, these sort of people, I definitely held you in a huge high regard in my head. I like, because I've, I, you know, as well, I've been um, a musical person for a long time, but mine's sort of always been more sort of jazz hands musical. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, and I always saw you three particularly amongst others um, as a real bastion of like how to be good at music at that time. And, and you guys definitely were involved in me picking up music a lot faster. Obviously I had, I only had a couple of years of lessons on um, Euphonium and I ended, I picked it up quite quickly because I was always around you guys, always around our friends, Sam Martin, Wasim, all these people who were just amazing at musicians. And it's like, I've got to pick up the pace really. Yeah, for sure. I, yeah, I, I remember I sold, I sold you my, uh, I sold you my P-bone. It's up there. It's <laughs> Is up, it up there? there? Yeah, yeah, it's on my shelf. Does it get much use? <laughs> it got a lot of use every Thursday when we were clapping for the nurses. <laughs> <laughs> My God. Oh man, that's so good. Yeah, because I, I always wondered what happened to that. And I, yeah, I remember a, a grubby deal that happened in like, uh, in Kilda. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it does get used. Oh, uh, I regret to inform you that this is one of the zips on the bag is broke. But apart from that, oh, every, I know. I, apart from <laughs> that, everything's in um, in great function and condition. Oh man, that's yeah, that's really good to hear. Um, so, so are you still are you still playing like euphonium and stuff? I don't actually have a euphonium. I am wanting to buy one. The plan was to buy one for this year because uh, I play with the miners gala. Obviously, it hasn't happened this year. But yeah. I tend to follow around, um, again, our mutual friend, Lewis Wilkinson. And yeah, sure. Where, wherever he goes, I tend to follow and hope that they have an instrument for me. Um, but obviously, Lewis has gone down to Cardiff, Swansea. He's in Cardiff, yeah, yeah. So I may have to find a new brass band. Yeah, and, <laughs> some new and, friends. And some new friends, definitely. <laughs> but yeah, the, um, it's all been a blessing in disguise because now I can, I am saving up for an instrument because it hasn't happened this year. So I haven't got an excuse not to have the money for next year. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really missing like, yeah, I'm missing Durham Day for sure. Like Murder's Game of Day. Uh, there's no better feeling than that. Uh, marching out on the front, just everybody kind of clapping and cheering and like sun in the sky and stuff. It's oh, what a day! Yeah, yeah. Well, that's us essentially talking about my next point now brass in Durham and in 
North Yorkshire, well, Yorkshire as a whole, really. Um, it's a re it's a really important thing, even though a lot of people wouldn't probably assume that it is. It's uh, and it, and I know you as um, someone that's very interested in history, very interested in music, and very interested in politics. So talking about brass and its culture just must be a bit of a walk in the park for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's. I, I, yeah, I, I think it's it's sort of synonymous with uh, with like northern culture, um, and it, it still plays a it still plays a really big part. Maybe not in like in like massive uh, like metropolitan areas like like Manchester and stuff, but especially when you get into like when you get into like northern towns and stuff. Like every town still has some semblance of a band, and uh, and like. And every like yeah, villages where there were like pits and uh mines and all of that sort of stuff. Uh they they yeah, they still hold on to that tradition. And yeah, I think it's one of the really yeah, one of the really sad things about uh about COVID, like especially is just like the um like doing a rehearsal over Zoom, for example, it's just it's just not the same sort of uh you can't really get the same community out of it like uh that you do by going to like a band room like twice yeah. a week and then doing like a contest at the end of it. Um, yeah, and then you miss out on all of the glorious, like, oh, it's, it's, it's a gorgeous day in, in Manchester today. Uh, yeah, and like going to a, a park and listening to a band in a bandstand, like it's, it's yeah, it's great. Uh, and actually, yeah, I miss it. I've not done, so I, I did a lot, I did a bit of banding when I was at uni uh, and I, I played in the the uni brass band and then I I conducted it for like a year and a half ish year, uh, but I've yeah I've not done too much banding uh, since I since I moved away from the northeast and it is yeah it's it's one of those things that I really miss uh, is is that sort of community uh, and like it's really good like good standard of playing as well which uh, I don't know always gets always gets forgotten a little bit that like these are players who will, will do like an hour's practice like every day like in some cases and will do like in a run up to a contest they'll do like something ridiculous like six rehearsals in seven days or something like especially when you get up to the higher levels of uh, of, of brass playing they are really really good players like you could definitely give some of the like some of the professional players a run for their money uh, and, and yeah, it's all done for the love of it, and that's the best thing about it. Is You're exactly nobody gets paid. right. You're exactly right. Um, I think for the for the love of it is the perfect way of saying it because I'd argue that a lot of people in these sort of village colliery bands, that sort of thing. I actually um, before I moved through to Durham, I was from a place called Craghead, and Craghead was and is a really rough place, and even they had. A band, yeah, I can't call you a band, yeah. And these, yeah. these, um, as you say, high-level musicians. I don't think that they'd give up the the band experience to go big time and go and play with Northern Symphonia or whoever, because that that's you that unity and, and of um, that sort of synergy of fifteen twenty people in a church hall. It's it's just it's it's a different breed, really. Yeah, exactly, and it's like I don't know. Um, I do get a little bit frustrated with with brass bands sometimes in that they they seem a little bit in a in like a in a bit of a time warp. Uh, they they sometimes like the 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 pads just like the, the music that they get out is I don't know is a little bit dated or they're like there'll be some people who just play play marches and hymn tunes and stuff and it's kind of all right but uh I don't know I think there's a there, there is a really there's a good balance that you can strike between doing stuff that's new and interesting and like pushing the envelope a little bit but also just like there's there's a real kind of collective sort of mindset that you get in a brass band that is so like everybody's striving to the same to for the same thing that you don't really get anywhere else in like even in like a 
in like wider sort of society where there's like I don't know 20 30 people all in the room uh really concentrating on doing one thing really well uh all together um and uh I don't know uh we've sort of lost that a little bit so I think yeah we should try and hold on to brass bands for for as long as we can uh, absolutely right. or at least until people get f- like completely sick of floral dance yeah. <laughs> and forget yeah. what that's all about <laughs> yeah. uh, so I'll always remember um four years ago when you moved away to university coming up five you said um because you well uh, lead into it you went to the Royal Northern College of Music is that right in Manchester just you in Manchester no, University yeah, I went to Manchester University. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I thought I'd done my research really right. Um, hey, okay. man, don't worry. But, yeah, ma- <laughs> don't yeah worry. Ma- Manchester University, done music. And on the day, you put, I think it was a tweet or something out, and you said that you'd travelled um, two and a half hours south to reach the figurehead of the north or something like that and it was a term that the Tories were using at the time yeah, when, um, yeah it was like yeah go on make up oh man yeah it was like yeah traveled like 100 miles south to discover the essence of northern grit yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh, so man. tell me about that time in Manchester yeah that... um yeah it was it was a it was a really great time. Uh, so I don't know. Towards the towards the end of uh, of living in living in the northeast and, and being at school in Fram and stuff, I I'd been I don't know. I always wanted to to keep like a couple of steps ahead with with everything that I was doing. Like always looking to the to the next thing. And I was not like not itching to get out of the northeast, but like I was I was ready for it for a change I was really willing to just like jump straight into uh to, to live in Manchester and yeah and it was it was really great and I moved down and uh and yeah just the, the first couple of weeks where just getting to know everything everything was like uh everything was new and shiny and uh there were all of these like opportunities and stuff that I'd never really had before and um and my immediate thought was just to like to grab them all and just and see what happened and kind of take the consequences of that later and uh uh ended up like in first year with just a ridiculous amount of stuff on my plate uh which was great um because i got to learn, know loads of people um and i don't know it's quite a dysfunctional sort of life that I was living through first year but it was yeah it was great but I don't know like I've always said that uh if the same sort of musical opportunities were available to me like uh in the northeast as they are like here or like in London or whatever um then I'd definitely I'd, I'd, I'd move back in an instant uh i yeah i love the northeast uh and and proper miss it, especially at the moment uh where i'm just like stuck in the house in sort of manchester suburbia um, i'd 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 kill for like a beach in the northeast or something oh uh, yeah that would be really great right now for sure um a few of my family went over to south shields yesterday and said it, it has never looked so idyllic it's with all of people not going yeah. and that sort of thing uh, it, because it's been empty for so long. And then when it stopped being yeah. empty, people were um, littering it fairly hardcore. So then people have taken notice and cleaned it and said yesterday, it, 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 it looked like it, it was uh, like a photograph that said it was really lovely. And you don't get that down south, do you, Hugh? <laughs> yeah, I know. No, I don't like. Yeah, but Manchester is, is, is great. It's a lovely, it's a great place to be. I like for sort of for for starting a career from like from not very much, but having loads of stuff to get involved with. It's it's a fantastic place, but it's not by the sea, and it's not quite the same as like as as being back in the northeast. Uh, which yeah, which is something that I've 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 sort of it's taken quite a while to. Uh, to sort to to realize i guess um 
is yeah I do miss the seaside and I miss the sort of the friendliness of the northeast it's like even within even in Manchester like it's, it's different like it's still like tons better than the feeling that you get down south uh for sure but like it's it's just not the same as home you know yeah <laughs> but um, yeah, but it's but it's good, uh, and there's lo- there's loads loads of stuff to get involved with here. Uh, and I had I had a really really great three years of of studying and doing all sorts of music at, at Manchester. And to be fair, like I mean, the best bit about it was just having like a really good really good community of of musicians and just like minded people. Uh, and like a lot of them as well. Like there was like eighty ish in my year who. We've all sort of we've all kind of stayed in touch and like I'm living now with with people who did the same course as me. Uh and that's gonna continue into like next year and stuff. And I still work every day with people that I uh that I worked with uh when I was at uni and stuff. Uh yeah, it's a it's a community that sort of that keeps on keeps on going, uh, which is really nice. But uh but yeah, I do miss the Northeast for sure. Um your musical knowledge has always been really good um of course and i'd never want to put you in a box obviously we've talked about um brass music a lot today when i do this i'm pointing towards my notes by the way i'm not talking to that's okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i've done it a few times i think if people don't know that my notes are here they're not gonna um <laughs> they're not gonna get it but like we've talked about brass and you've obviously a big fan of um, brass music and orchestral music choral music all sorts was there anything in your studies in Manchester that you weren't expecting to like as much as you did any sort of style of uh, any styles of yeah. music that you picked up along the way yeah for sure so uh, <laughs> so one of the sort of one of the really big moments for me was so I I auditioned, I remember in my first week in like Freshers Week, I auditioned for loads and loads of stuff uh, and was quite fortunate that there weren't many like, there weren't many trombone players. Uh, so I got into quite a few things and uh, two of the, two of the big bands that I got into. So there was like, there's one called MSC Big Band, which uh, do, so they do one sort of style and Manchester Uni big band like the sort of official university one so those were two really kind of really like foundational ensembles I guess for me because uh they just taught me a different like a completely different understanding of like what what jazz can be uh and like how it can uh how it can sort of function in a way that's not just like not like Glenn Miller and Duke Ellington and stuff and so like on the one hand you had Manchester Uni Big Band who did like they did lots of sort of jazz that's quite a bit like sort of free jazz more kind of more contemporary music uh and like a bit more like like the structures are a little bit more free and a lot more like open improvisation uh and a lot less swing essentially uh and then you had MSC Big Band on the other hand who sort of took the big band model and essentially stuck it in a club uh and so they so instead of playing like big band charts and stuff at club nights they do like sort of naughty pop bangers and then go into into like r&b and neo soul and uh like work on like creating original music off that sort of background um which like there were sort of two different approaches to to jazz music uh that I never really thought that I would ever get into and like now I've come out of the end of it and I'm working for a record label in London who are like they're like a they're a contemporary jazz label uh and doing like they they release loads of free free jazz stuff and uh but I'm also like reviewing for jazz wise and doing bits and pieces to do with all of this like uh to do with like the jazz of the moment which does like jazz and dub and r&b and neo soul and all of these terms that just combines all of those things so yeah i'd say all of those different approaches to jazz are uh are what i took out of it um the most Uh, yeah and just like surprised me i never thought that i'd come out of uni and just be like working for a jazz label uh i was always told 
I don't know, when I told people in the Northeast that I wanted to do music, it was always just like, oh, so you're going to be a teacher or, uh, oh, you're going to play in an orchestra. And I never really wanted to do either of those things, but I knew that I wanted to do something. Um, so it was sort of like, like keeping them at, at bay a little bit uh, and saying like, uh, no, I want to, I definitely want to do something, but I'm not quite sure what it is yet. And just trying to believe that something would come along, I guess. And it, and it kind of has. So that leads almost perfectly into my next question. You've mentioned there this, um, this label that you're working for. What other projects have you, um, have you got going on? Are you still writing? Are you still, well, I can imagine you're still writing because I know what you like. But yeah. Um, so, oh man, I've got, I've got quite a lot. Uh, so, so just before lockdown, I, uh, so I had a job with a, uh, with an audio branding company. They, so they, they provide music for adverts and for, uh, yeah, like commercials and like bits for social media clips and stuff uh, for companies all around the world, especially in America, which was kind of strange because like I went from like having zero knowledge of like, like seventies, like Americana rock sort of stuff like having zero knowledge of that to suddenly like a hundred in like two weeks because you'd get all of these like Bob's tires from like California or something phoning you up and saying that they want like a rock track to go with their advert and you'd kind of have to go okay cool I can put together a rock track so we did that uh so I had that for about a month and it was quite good fun uh but then I got laid off and uh I was determined not to just like be in the doldrums about it. So I got back on the freelancing trade, which we all love. Um, so uh, off the back of that, I, so what am I doing? So I'm working for a, the jazz label in London. So I'm doing like social media and copy and content creation and that sort of stuff. Uh, I'm writing an opera about uh, Newcastle United and the, uh, Mike Ashley sort of saga, which uh, is happening at the end of July. Um, I um, write in a bit, picking up a couple of like like feature writing gigs or what, whatever I can find. Uh, I'm composing a bit. I go through a bit of a phase of uh, I'll apply for loads of stuff and uh, and then I'll so I'll go like apply, 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 and then compose, 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 apply, 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 and just keep that cycle going a little bit um and apart from that just kind of trying to keep sane during lockdown i guess um which i think we're all trying at the moment uh yeah uh it's it's nice though because uh, i'm living in a house of uh of of musicians and they're all sort of interesting and creative in their own in their own different ways uh so uh they sort of the fact that they keep on doing stuff means that I feel like I should be doing stuff, <laughs> yeah, yeah. which which is a, as good a driver as any to to keep on going and doing doing bits. Yeah. So what are you like? It's a really, some would call it a sort of biblical esque time. The moment everything is falling apart at the same time. How are you finding inspiration to keep doing things that you enjoy doing? Oh. Uh, Good question. Um, uh, I think the first thing is uh, is realizing that like there's a, there's a conductor called Marin Olsop, uh, who she's she's from America and like I think she was the first conductor to first female conductor to conduct the last night of the proms. Uh, like she's a incredible conductor and she put up a video uh, not too long ago that I watched and she said that. Uh, like her main bit of advice was, was to just to just like take your time and realize that this like take a good couple of weeks to realize that this is like a a world like a, a worldwide moment like this will this is a proper big historical moment that will probably change everything and like to be able to sort of power through that uh uh like kind of blinkers and not really paying attention to anything um we just uh, it doesn't really it doesn't really work like that so just like taking your time to realize that this is a a really big sort of thing that we're dealing with uh has been quite comforting i guess in terms of like in terms of inspiration uh i like doing projects with my mates um and like just phoning somebody up and 
saying, oh, uh, do you fancy doing this? And it's really nice because people aren't really up to that much at the moment. So like, you know, they'll either say yes or they will just, they, they will be ignoring you. <laughs> um, uh, like th there's no real, there's no real opportunity for them to say no. So yeah, just get involved in those. It's quite a nice time to, to experiment on, on new stuff. Uh, so I, I downloaded, uh, I downloaded Logic Pro, uh, on, on my Mac, um, and had like a 90 day trial and, uh, I know, I've never, I've never really done anything with like electronic music or, or like, uh, production or whatever. Uh, but just having a couple of little ideas on there and just pushing all the buttons and seeing what happened was, was quite fun. Even if it didn't really come to anything in the end, uh, like, yeah, this, I guess now is the time to sort of, to do those projects that don't necessarily have like a, have a, have an end goal, uh, uh, and just yeah, just to, to have a bit of fun with it, uh, to to always try and keep being creative, and just yeah, and try and get all the practical things in, like uh, like eating well and doing some exercise, and actually going out of the house because I think it's really easy to to just sit here in my room and do absolutely nothing. Uh, so yeah, just just trying to keep some sort of routine, I guess. Yeah. Have you tr have you ever tried um, the old locking yourself in a room to and leaving when something's done? Because I, I remember a story by um, I think it was Jacob Collier. He like he obviously Jacob Collier for people that don't know is a, is a musical genius that just thinks on a different frequency. He's just yeah. insanely talented, and he one of his songs he just put himself in a room and i think it was for like nine days and when he left he'd had one of these insane songs that he does have you ever tried of just forcing yourself to write or do you think that that um uh, there is um there's another quote i can't remember who it's by but there's someone saying like you can force someone into a room and tell them to practice keepy ups. You can force them into a room and tell them to do maths. You can't force someone into a room and force them to be creative. Yeah. Does that work? Have, um, you, have you tried that outlet of just sitting down until you've got something, or is that not how you work? I, I don't know. I, um, I don't normally work like that. Uh, which. I don't know. It's it's difficult because yeah, I I I agree. I I don't think that people can kind of be forced into a room and forced to be creative. But unfortunately, the world doesn't quite work uh, to accommodate that. So I think trying to balance like that with uh, with a couple of sort of hard and fast deadlines to make sure that you've to make sure that you actually do stuff uh, is is the way that I like to do it i think uh, there have been a couple of times like especially in <laughs> especially in uni where it, i'd have something due the next morning and it would be like i don't know it would be 10 o'clock and uh I'd, I'd i'd make myself a very very strong coffee so it was like uh it was kind of impossible for me to 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 sort of go to sleep and and forget about it to make sure that i actually got something down on paper but um yeah i don't know i think that sort of locking yourself in the room for for nine days uh it's not it's not that healthy and although it might make a a good story like i mean people like jacob collier uh i don't know uh he can do that sort of stuff like he's crazy um i don't know i i wouldn't like to do that for sure yeah, no, I don't <laughs> yeah I'd, I'd go but uh, yeah maybe i could be more like jacob collier if i if i did that well there's only one way to find out you <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Shut that door. <laughs> um, yeah, lock it from the outside. Oh, yeah, wow. as you say there, like a strong coffee helps you. I always um, prefer the Stephen Sondheim approach where he says he will not sit down at the piano unless he has a glass of whiskey on it. <laughs> just, <laughs> that's a good way to just uh, just tinker around with the piano. Yeah, although actually, uh, yeah, one of the good things about just, yeah, just before lockdown, uh, I had a bit of a a bit of a coffee crisis where I realised I like I was drinking far too much and it was just making me far too like 
anxious and scatty are like uh, uh, I just completely cut it out of my diet which uh, I didn't realize that I could do uh, and yeah I've and I've never looked back no I have looked back uh, but um, but yeah I definitely recommend for, for anybody in that position uh, yeah cut out coffee it, it can it can do the world of good for sure <laughs> so, so moving on from music now you um have always been very involved as well and into as i mentioned before politics as people um as people with good eyes will be able to spot you've got eight copies of private eye on the wall oh, man. <laughs> yeah is that really cool? oh. no i just yeah. uh, I, I i it's just something i do I, I i just i just look but um but yeah and i've noticed <laughs> that you've done um like a couple of got a couple of um bits of columns a couple of that sort of thing is that is that like i know I'm, most of the things you've been right now on music but it's like you've you've been going down the sort of political route as well i gather yeah uh so i've i've always been like i did i did politics a level and the two teachers who i did it with were were really great and they sort of fostered a like a real kind of appreciation for uh for for politics and it's wider um it's it's wider place uh in me i guess uh and then i don't know i went to uni and was was surrounded by lots of like similar minded people which made the which kind of turned me off politics a little bit i didn't really do anything too like political through uni and then since like coming out of the back of it and especially during during lockdown and there's so many like, there's not too much like news happening uh apart from these huge sort of political scandals like the dominic cummings one and like black lives matter and uh and like the whole way that the government has dealt with the with the coronavirus i've sort of i've got more like i've got back into it a little bit more um and yeah i've been writing uh yeah so so when when i lost my job i decided to put because not much music is happening and it was just to, to sort of pay the bills essentially uh i needed to to change tack a little bit so uh i put more effort into or more time more energy into writing about stuff uh so picking up a few pieces and uh a little bit of like investigative journalism like like digging for scoops and stuff uh and uh yeah and it's sort of it's it's all coming to fruition a little bit uh uh but yeah definitely getting more involved in politics now uh as uh as as lockdown goes on uh it's it's a it's a weird sort of uh it's a weird sort of situation uh now that i've got more time to read about stuff again uh and to actually like think about stuff you kind of realize how how sort of screwed the world is and screwed the uk is um as i'm sure other people are uh realizing but yeah uh i think one thing that i've never really strayed away from is the is the long facebook uh political post or the or the the big massive angry tweet like uh, uh i've always been quite good at that uh, uh and enjoyed that uh but now i don't know i think the people who maybe disagreed with me have, have blocked me or unfriended me or whatever uh so now i just get loads of heart reacts which is kind of nice but also I miss those I kind of miss those days of, of like not picking a fight with somebody in the Facebook comment sections, but like having a good like a good chin wag with with people who sort of disagree uh, with you. I guess. Hey, what I think is yeah. pretty dangerous about um, like as you sort of said, Facebook and Twitter and that sort of thing is as you say like a lot of people that disagree with you have blocked you and that sort of thing and i don't think there's anything worse for people to think that everyone agrees with them because what how being in a situation on social media especially where you can pick and choose everything that you want to see and talk about and putting yourself in that echo chamber can just make you think yeah. like well everyone i know agrees with me so i'm right and it's so yeah. Good. Twitter's probably um, twi it probably that happens less on Twitter because obviously you can just find anything you want. But but Facebook especially, it's it's rough. 
I don't know. Um, I would actually say the opposite. I think. I think that um, that that Twitter, especially like, I had a big, I did a big Facebook post about like about the last election, uh, and um, just afterwards, kind of complaining about this exact fact. And I think Twitter was actually worse. I would just see like a couple of people who would just clog up your feed, retweeting stuff about like uh, COVID and. Uh, and finding like all of these like very kind of skewed stats about how Labour were going to do um, and filling loads of people with a false sense of hope and realising that they like making people think that they don't have to go out and like actively engage with with other people who disagree with them to um, to turn that into votes because like I don't know the at the end of the day like these people who just like if there's one, I don't know, one left-wing person and two, like, more centrist or right-wing people, uh, like, and no matter how sort of morally right you think you are, they have more votes than you uh, at an election and they can they can outvote you. Um, and, like, if that ratio is applied to, like, to, like, a whole constituency and stuff, no matter how, like, fantastic and wonderful you think you are, like, other people, you, you have to engage with them in order to that's just kind of the way that the whole system works uh and it was really sad like i went out poll like i went out to be fair it was the first time that i've ever really gone out like doing doorstepping for for labor on in what was it december yeah 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 December. Uh, yeah. yeah and i was in i was in Bury south which uh the tories won by maybe like 400 votes or something right. on the day uh and I was going around the uh, going around the doorsteps, and like I'd been on Twitter earlier, and I was like, "Oh, just yeah, we're gonna absolutely like gonna walk it. It's it's gonna be a big like I don't know, like a, a Labour victory of some sort." And just listening to these people who uh, like so many will just so like yeah, they all voted Tory, and they will just shut the door in your face. And it's like it's sad. But you've sort of got, yeah, you've got to listen to them. You've got to listen to their, to their concerns, even if they, uh, they aren't the same as your own. Um, and I think that's something that potentially going forward is a little bit damaging. Uh, and like everyone, as you said, getting stuck in that social media bubble uh, and just believing all of that and not really making any efforts to sort of strike out of it uh, is means that we might just, we are left in like a situation uh, like the last election where we thought, I don't know, we thought Labour were going to win it. That was a huge Tory majority uh, and then we're screwed for another five years. So, yeah. Yeah, the, um, the, the Tory majority, I'm not even going to say the Tory majority because I, did, I didn't think that Labour would win, but just how the Tories have won of places like like places in Sunderland and Newcastle, as you say, down in Manchester, like yeah, and Tory. Like, like and, uh, and I know, like, I know that neither of us have been alive long enough um, to sort of remember the whole uh, mining crisis of the eighties and the, the, like under Margaret Thatcher. But it just it made me think like people must have short memories. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I take that, but. I think as well, it's like people have short memories, but then uh, there's been, there's definitely been a a failure on Labour's part to to engage like people, especially during like in, during the Blair years, and I think uh, I think during the during the Corbyn years as well, uh, like it was kind of assumed that oh yeah, well Corbyn is like has come in and he'll naturally like engage the the voters in like. The north northeast or like the northwest like post industrial like britain and stuff uh and he did yeah he did okay and like there were big turnouts at like uh at miners gale and stuff but like some people have moved on and people aren't really forgiving the labor party for the for the blair years and, and stuff uh and it was really unfortunate for for corbyn because i think yeah he was a a really a really principled guy but uh 
he couldn't really strike up the the cooperation uh and draw enough people from like who perhaps disagreed with him uh to kind of hold their nose and vote for Labour. Uh it was really good for like cementing really core support, which going forward I think is really good. But uh we'll see uh under Keir Starmer where where the country might go. Yeah, we certainly uh, will. Okay, so the last sort of talking point I've got for us, Hugh, you mentioned before writing this um, offer about Newcastle United, but you're actually a Rochdale supporter up the Dale. Um, yeah. And from what I've heard, well, le- well I'll, I'll, I'll let you talk. What do you think about the Football League in their cancellings of seasons and not the cancelling of others? Oh man, uh, good question. I, I mean, it's it's good for Rochdale in that like we we're, we're going to spend the seventh consecutive season in League One, which considering we have a budget which should be like at the bottom of League Two, uh, or even like it's it's kind of a conference budget, and we have like a conference crowd. Uh, we get like a, a gate of like maybe two and a half thousand, three thousand nowadays, which compared to some like like Sheffield Wednesday or other teams that Sunland? were in the championship. The like Sunderland and that 000. sort of thing, isn't it? Sunderland, exactly, yeah. And Sunderland's a huge, huge state. Exactly, like Sunderland who get... Yeah, I mean, they got... Uh, I watched uh, I watched Sunderland Till I Die and uh, on, on Netflix and like their, their Boxing Day crowd that was like 40-something thousand, which was amazing. But also like, yeah, like compared to Rochdale is is amazing. Uh on a side note, the most tin pot Rochdale thing that I've ever seen uh was so when Sunderland came for for like a league match, uh Rochdale decided to pr- they printed commemorative mugs saying like Rochdale versus Sunderland on them that you could get in the club shop. And it was just like the most kind of face palm thing you've ever seen. Uh but yeah, um, it's good for Rochdale in that they've cancelled the season. It's also really bad for Rochdale because they, I mean, they don't have like owners with like a huge amount of money that they can uh, just like flash about. And actually, yesterday, they, uh, it was quite a bit of controversy because uh, Rochdale's like striker, like and captain, fantastic Ian Henderson. Uh, he got released by the club despite having been there for like seven and a half years and being the club's like second top goal scorer. Uh, so he he got released um, and everyone was really sad about that. And it later turned out he put on Instagram that that social media post that the uh, that the club had put out was the first that he knew about it. Oh, um, wow. So like he didn't know that he was getting released until. He saw that, like, until he saw that Twitter post. So, um, yeah, it's kind of, it's it's good and bad. Uh, it, that Rochelle will, will be in League One. Um, it's bad because now we've got nobody in. Uh, we've got, a, we have a really poor squad, <laughs> as it is, uh, made it, and we don't have any more money to, to spend on it. So we're just going to be, like, we're definitely going to get relegation next, next season. So it's, like, prolonging the... Uh, prolonging the inevitable um, and I don't know uh, it is nice seeing all the football back though like uh, we've got BT Sports in, in our house and it's just a, been a solid segue from like Bundesliga um, just straight into the Premier League and it's yeah, yeah it's amazing to watch it back like uh, I watched the oh, the the Watford game yesterday uh, Watford um, Watford Leicester it was it was a good game, and then like 89th minute, Chilwell scores an absolute screamer, and then uh, like 90 plus four, Craig Dawson scores an overhead kick, and Craig Dawson they used to play for Rochdale, and I was just like, oh man, I was so happy when that went in. For yeah, sure. it was two absolute banging goals, <laughs> like just yeah, out, out of nowhere. Out, like obviously, um, Leicester doing really well. Um, have the opportunity to go top four, but under Nigel Pearson, Watford have been doing all right. Yeah, I know there were times like um, there were times when they looked like really, really good. Like Will Hughes had an amazing game; he was so good. Um, and 
yeah, and just to, to pull out that overhead kick for like at the last minute um, it was crazy. I think uh, the thing that still I can't quite get over is uh, is the crowd noise, and not because like the crowd noise is there, but occasionally like on the BC Sport uh, stream, they they'll put up a. a like a reminder that you can get it like just with the stadium atmosphere so it'll oh, go from like all of these crowds shouting and stuff to absolute silence and just shouts and swearing and, and and stuff and that's yeah it's it's freaky i wish i was the person like pushing the buttons for uh to do all of the crowd noise oh, yeah. that was a great moment in the in the bundesliga where um you could tell that there was just a guy who had like a like a boo button or like an applause button and uh and he was proper maxing out on it or like one of those like the whistle button where like there's been a really bad like decision <laughs> he's just like whistle 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 we right. um I, it's that's a, the same sort of thing yesterday happened at the end of the arsenal brighton game obviously there, yeah. was, there was a bit of a scuffle with uh, oh man yeah I, <laughs> with and neil Morpe, and someone was like boo <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know um yeah I, I caught the end of that and i caught what what mope said and fair play to him i'm always really uh really amazed when when footballers come out and and say something like controversial uh and like ruffle a few feathers and stuff because like they've got so many things in their contract saying that like you'll get a certain amount of bonuses if you essentially just keep your mouth shut so it's really uh it's really great when neil mope comes out and just says uh <laughs> says what he says yeah it's well, it, was, it wasn't good for me as, as you can imagine and all this <laughs> all, <laughs> the, all that you've been mentioning about Rochdale um, getting relegated next year I don't think we'll far be, um, be far behind because we are <laughs> just Arsenal are just abysmal at the moment which is fine yeah man. which is fine <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah just watching them at the moment it's it's poor. My uh, one of my housemates is an Arsenal fan, and uh, <laughs> he was just, yeah, he was inconsolable yesterday. Just put him in a proper bad mood. Yeah, it's rough. Okay, um, Hugh, that brings us to a lovely end of the podcast. Thank you very much for coming on. I've really enjoyed yeah, this. Thank you. Yeah, and it's lovely to see you again. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. We should definitely, definitely, definitely. We should definitely. I'm so good with definitely, words. Definitely, we should definitely. Yeah, yes. uh, we we should make an attempt to be doing things not just you and me, but we'll get the gang back together and uh, that sort of thing. Because we should, yeah, we should just be doing that. Q, last thing I want to ask you: Have you got any social media that you want to plug, or any websites or projects? Yeah, sure. Uh, may as well. So I'm uh, at hwfm. Oh uh, no! At HWFM on Instagram, at HWF Morris on Twitter. Um, I'd say follow the Twitter. There's more happening there. Uh, HughMorrisMusic.co.uk is my website, uh, and that's about it. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for coming on here. I've thoroughly enjoyed this. Yes, me too, Sam. Nice one. Um, and yeah, so um, yeah, this has been Sam Bryan as his friends with Hugh Morris, and um, we'll see you later. Thanks a lot.